reframing your marketing strategy beyond COVID-19. Please give it up to Mike Prasad, founder at Tiny Sponsor. This is for you. Also, please welcome on the stage Adrian Niculescu, CMO EME at CloudCount Consortium. Please, I don't hear you clapping. Please put your hands together. Thank you so much. Also, please welcome on the stage Kosmin Meshensky, CEO at First Bite Media. Give him a big hand. Also, put your hands together and welcome on stage Darius Kunza, CEO at Ad Kings. Be louder, please. Thank you. Oh, this is nice. Please continue like that. Also, please welcome on the stage Aptin Saidi, journalist and content creator at Aptin. Give him a big hand, please. And last but not least, Frank Harold, business development director at Emirate AG. Mike, the floor, the floor is yours, and please be attentive. Thank you. One, two, one, two. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming today. Uh, we have an amazing panel today. We're going to talk about marketing in a post or a, a COVID and future world. We have an amazing line of panelists. If I uh, could have everyone starting at the end, give us a brief intro of um, who you are, a little bit of your background, where you're from. My name is Frank. I'm a director of Emirate. Emirate is a German company that has been founded in 2004. I joined the company about five years ago before I was running and uh, was working in different international and uh, also national media companies in Germany and uh, also worldwide. And Emirate, what do we, uh, what do, we do? We uh, offer a global insurance for marketing, for games, for lottery, so for redemption marketing, also for uh, sports events. Uh, so that's what we do since 2004 and we work globally. Hi, my name is Upton. I'm a uh, media strategist and content creator. So I make videos about tech, money, cultures, and I have clients in which I, me and my team make videos for them. So for their LinkedIn, for their YouTube, for their TikTok, basically to help uh, short videos that ultimately drive engagement and signups. Hey guys, so one of the things that you learn about me is either I'm talking very, very clear and short of a sentence or I'm joking around, one of the two. Um, so I'm um, Darius, co-founder of Hackens Agency and we are e-commerce specialized marketing agency that did over $200 million in sales. Hi guys, I see you again. Uh, it's Cosmin, uh, I have a crypto lead generation media company, so we provide leads to our partners basically. Good evening, everybody. Very happy to be here today. I'm Adrian Nicolescu, serial entrepreneur and investor. I'm CMO at CloudCoin Consortium, advisor or investor in other projects. I have more than 10 years marketing experience, or as an agency, as a freelancer, as a team leader. So I did most of the mistakes, uh, I hope, and uh, happy to contribute today. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I'm Mike Prasad. I'm the founder of Tiny Sponsor and Every Creator. We build the Web3 platform for creators, and I have a lot of experience in marketing, uh, specifically in social media, pioneering with Twitch and uh, Twitter and whatnot. So today, we're going to talk about looking at how you are reframing your marketing strategies beyond COVID-19. So let's start with the first question, open to anyone in the panel. What do you think we are today in the behavior pattern regarding COVID-19? And we, obviously we're here today in a conference hall, everyone here is comfortable. But from a market behavior point of view, do you think consumer behavior uh, and internet behavior has adapted or are we still in transition? I would say yes. I think the biggest thing when, it, when we look at creating content, people used to like polished and aspirational videos. But I think partially because of COVID, you saw a lot of people become content creators and make their own videos with their phones. And now it's gotten to a point where people don't want super polished uh, videos and, and content when they consume it. Because if you think about social media, a lot of times you're coming off of your friend's video 
So all of a sudden, if you see this super well-polished drone shot cinematic video from a company, you're thinking, okay, this must be an ad, and I'm going to swipe away. I would like to add an angle from um, the startup world, which I believe is very relevant. We all of us sell something, a product, a service, or we sell our time. And when you are a startup, let's say, and if you uh, are going towards investors, you are selling to them an opportunity. And before the pandemic period, most of the investors said, okay, you need to come to us. You need to visit our office in order to meet face-to-face, uh, -face, you know? But what happens during the pandemic, and this trend will continue, investors are ready, even the big guns, to have a face-to-face, one-to-one online call, you know? And this lowers actually the, the bar in terms of uh, how easy it is to reach to people. You can use LinkedIn, you can pitch them, you can make a call, and you can get investments. And even if you are from what we are calling, let's say, an underprivileged territory, you still can do that. But you need to be proactive and not to be reactive waiting for things to happen. So you need to make things happen. Yeah, I think to be honest, like COVID changed the world forever. And the biggest change is definitely in the work industry that a lot more people are not working from an office the way they used to. And at the same time, this changes that they're buying behavior, their usage patterns of social media, uh, TV watch times, etc. And what we are seeing that the times that we used to be buying before now are completely different. And a lot of marketing agencies and businesses should be adapting their strategy according to that. So what I'm hearing, oh, go ahead. No, it's, no I just agree. And uh, additional to that, also technology helps to change that, to, to, to speed up that process. So. When we talked about digitalization, we didn't have that pressure that we now feel from the, from the COVID uh, uh, time. So digitalization, looking international, it means also digitalization of, of, of out of home advertising, of, 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 of TV screens, of all that media stuff. So it's not only bringing about more brand width into the, into the uh, rooms, it's also about getting people more specific reached at different points, even if it is not at home on TV or on online. So what I'm hearing is a combination of factors that really go back to this idea of individual at scale. It's very authentic, it's very real, not as polished, but this one-to-one -one connection scaled out is what it sounds like. Yeah, I would say, I would say that kind of, I said this earlier, like amateur by design is actually a term being used by YouTubers where it's like we have a team, we have the equipment, we have the money, but we want to make it relatable. And I think, you know, going on to your, off of your point, it's like people, um, people, you know, it's kind of like what happened with Instagram, you know? It's like with Instagram, it used to be a very, a, a, a place to post aspirational content. You know, private jet, hotel rooms, you know, living my best life. And then TikTok came along, which is now, you know, more used than, than Instagram. And that was the opposite. TikTok, for those who are not using it, actually despises aspirational content because it's not real, it's not relatable, it's not authentic. And I think because of COVID, that's what drove, it, drove this, right? No one was in a, in a five-star hotel or on a private jet during COVID, right? We were all kind of anxious, what's next? We were at home in lockdown. And so, so I think, in a way, I, I almost credit or, you know, point my finger at TikTok for, for starting this new wave of, of, of branded and marketing content that's become a lot more, I guess, real. Can I add something? And I super agree with him. And what, what happened is like, we really want something that is real, that is, uh, you can uh, see each other in the, in the product or service that, that you are trying to advertise. So if it's not real and you don't speak the language, then you, you don't get the, to, to sell them what you want. What's interesting is um, both of you are highlighting also what Adrian mentioned when it comes to investors is this very direct, very visceral experience that's become something that is normally, when you think about online, you think about scale, you think about uh, a very big gap between the viewer and the creator. And now what you're talking about now is this 
very real, tangible feeling of connection across the communities, whether it's with investors, whether it's with marketing and content creators. With this change in behavior, do you see that these behavioral changes in societies across the world in a, in a somewhat unified manner, do you see this being very long-term and permanent, or do you think we're going to transition to something else as we become more and more open uh, within the COVID situation? Thank you. Uh, so, I believe that, that it's a transition, as we also spoke before. It's something that we, we have to pass on, like we have to go through it. And what happened in, during uh, the time that we are all uh, were home is that we, we developed new, new, different uh, habits. And those habits now, they are reflected in everything we do. And, and it will take still some time to get back to where we were, to, to the habits that we had before. And, uh, it's still a transition, but uh, I think there are you, some of the things that happened, it will stay with us forever now. Yeah, yeah. I do completely agree. To be honest, I think the world overall is running in cycles. Some cycles are longer, some smaller. But what I'm seeing is now we are in this user-generated content, like low-quality content, just pushing the content that's real. But I wouldn't be amazed like in two years to see once again professional content coming back because it's always like this. People want something different, and this is one like constant in the world that there is. When, when we're looking into our clients' behavior, we see an absolute increase, for example, in online lotteries, in online gambling, in online games worldwide. But on the other hand, you cannot, you should also see that concerning the, 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 the thing of trust, uh, it's very important also to build a brand, a big brand or strong brand in the offline world. So I was in Latin America uh, four weeks ago and they said even the local based shops and stores where they work, they are not for bringing, running the money, but it's for, for building up the brand, for bringing up trust. So even if the money runs into online business, you should not think that the offline world is out of media, out of relevance. Yeah, just to add on to that, I think, you know, in Marketing 101, they teach you testimonials, right? That's a powerful form of marketing. And I think what we saw, like, let's say 10 years ago is you see a, a TV commercial, for instance, and you see somebody talking about the product or the service. And in the small print, what does it say? Actor, right? Not real testimonial. This is just a paid actor. And then, I don't know, five years ago, we saw them actually using real people and they proudly said, this is a real testimonial. Well, now we're seeing everybody give their own testimonials with their smartphone and companies are just using that. You know, I mean, obviously they're getting permission, but that's created a huge opportunity. And if you look at Chipotle, for example, the, uh, the, the chain restaurant in the US, um, they, their TikTok page, for example, is only just grabbing users videos and saying hey we liked your video about lunch your lunch can we just use that as our marketing and they'll put money behind that right so it's a there's a threat because they don't a lot of times companies don't know what the hell they're doing with with this new age of marketing but it's also an opportunity to save a lot of money um, and if you know what you're doing you see we marketers we have a very powerful weapon once we identify uh, what is called the ideal buyer persona for a product or a service, we know about these people what happens in their mind. We know what keeps them awake at night and we have to use these things ethically. In a crisis, what happens, the survival triggers are activated. So that's why we may start, I don't know, buying tons of toilet paper or oil or do um, stupid things. And in those moments, more than ever, we need to belong to something, to a community. And the smart brands create those communities so to make us safe, to make us belong to that community, it's design, it's not done by default. So unconsciously, we become addicted to the products and services which are promoted in the community. There are cycles and these cycles are repeating. So uh, uh, the human mind will work in the same way over the next years until we die, right? So depending on what's, happen uh, what's happening around us, 
we need to analyze what's happening around us and to act accordingly because uh, it, it's part of the research we need to do. But things will not change because the human mind works the same way. I love that idea that uh, marketing is still dealing with humans and the human behavior is still uniform in that sense. Uh, the tools obviously change and we're seeing the behavior change of the market change. So on this idea of shared trust, this idea of community connection, uh, we've all highlighted on. One of the clients I have um, uh, is called Flip.Shop and they're actually a platform that all of their content is user reviews of products. So going back to what you're saying, it's the user review is actually becomes the content. So in an environment where user generated content can be in some cases the primary or sole driver of the business, where does the brand's messaging come from? If the brand has traditionally been promoting an ideology, a value set, a key messaging point of view, but in an environment now where it is the user's messaging who actually has more value and at scale has more value, which is out of the control of the brand, how do you adjust messaging or what becomes the brand's position in this environment? I think like a role of brand is pretty simple. It's about having like two, three things that people care about. And whenever you're working with influencers, users, whatsoever, the goal is for them to continue mentioning the same things and do it repeatedly enough till everybody kind of resonates with it and they accept it as real. There are many different strategies how to approach it. For example, there's like a new thing, very popular thing called whitelisting, where you actually get access to your Instagram celebrities accounts. You take their content and actually pay for that content to run ads to, and you reach much more people with it. So you can basically, you know, use this content to like very selectively present specific messages from specific influencers to a wide variety of audience. Yeah, I think the, the funnel almost becomes wider now. So I think, I think what I tell, you know, clients I work with is like, you know, think about how do you create awareness and build awareness. First, get them to follow you. Like, you know, 10 years ago, a lot of companies on their TV commercials, were, their call to action was follow us on Facebook, right? But now the, the interesting thing with a platform like TikTok or even Instagram Reels is you can find a new customer, right? You don't necessarily need them to, in fact, most people are not going into TikTok or Instagram and searching for a company, right? They see them on their feed and they want to follow them. So I think creating a connection with your audience is a lot more important. And one thing we do is kind of a three tier approach. Tier one is content about the brand. Tier two is value, creating value, teaching your customer something new that's related to the industry. And tier three is just fun, just silly trends, you know, let's say on TikTok, silly trends that makes them want to follow you. And then, you know, hopefully they'll see some of your branded content later on. So does this mean that the brand's positioning is actually less so broadcast, more so curation and this idea of curating and developing community and curating from that community and becoming more of a, a stage for their audience? Or would you say it's a little bit more heavy handed than that? I think it can be, but I think one thing that's, you know, you, you can, brands can create their own content that seems like uh, it's from their audience. It's just a matter of giving the keys to the right person, right? And usually they don't. Usually brands say, okay, you've been managing our Facebook and our Instagram and you know, the marketing budget, manage the TikTok. And that's a big mistake because it's a very different kind of content. So you know, we, create con we create content where we literally tell our team to just do selfie mode and we give that content to brands, right? Selfie mode sitting on a bed. But the problem is most big companies do not feel comfortable doing that because it's, it's scary. Like you said, how do they can, I mean, obviously everything's still approved, but the idea of doing it so amateur just scares a lot of companies. So we talked a lot about behavioral changes, content creation changes, a shift to community, the shift to a trust-based type of dynamic. What are some of the changes that that means in terms of your marketing channel usage? So going from paid versus influencer versus content publishing uh, versus SEO, for example, what are some of the strategies and the change in those strategies that you've done to adapt to the behavioral changes in the market. Yeah, and here I want once a day to talk about the cycles that I mentioned before, uh, because what I'm seeing now, the competition digital landscape increased exponentially after COVID, and a lot of people say that we're all e-commerce hopped like seven years ahead due to the COVID. And my number one thing, what we are changing now, is actually becoming less and less reliant on paid media channels like Facebook, Instagram, 
TikTok and other things where we're running at and going more towards user-generated content and getting back to the channels that are not popular. Because once again, where there's too much attention, it becomes more expensive. And when you go where there's less attention, it's usually cheaper. Remember one thing. People love to buy, but don't want to be sold. So uh, in your marketing strategy, try everything you can to trigger the most important element in marketing called reciprocity. If you deliver value, 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 but somehow don't ask for anything in return, so the selling is seen like a result, sooner or later, your audience will start feeling that they have to give back because they received a lot. It's something which happens in the subconscious mind where all the processes are, uh, uh, are created. So they will not just start to being hooked by giving you something, which usually means to buy from you, you know, to, to, to give you something back, but they can become your next non-paid influencers actually because they will say, okay, I got this from this company. They will show to their audience and you will have actually more and more clients coming virally towards you without the need to invest in paid advertising. So think about give a lot of value and trigger the reciprocity from your audience. It will work like crazy. I wanted to add that as you said before, uh, we want to belong to someone, to, to a brand or maybe a group of people. And that's where I see the shift. Uh, it's not anymore like uh, one way talking, but it's like being part of a community. Uh, like right now, my personal example is that before we were super focused on SEO and maybe some social media, but right now we are driving toward the creation of a community, maybe thank you, thanks to to Discord, to Telegram groups, and so on. So where we use their generated uh, uh, content, so maybe there are some screenshots, videos from their uh, activities online, and they use it in the, in the group, uh, in the community, and everybody else sees that. And once they see it, and you have the re reciprocity, uh, so you see like a social proof of other people doing something, and they also want to do that, and, and it's like, uh, it's a domino effect. It starts uh, with the community, and then uh, you, the people will be like basically attached to your brand. So we're seeing this theme of not being a moving from a purely what used to be decades ago broadcast primarily only type marketing strategy to more of a curation, creating dynamics, engagement, and understanding a funnel to then have that funnel generate other output that goes back into marketing. So a circular type of holistic approach. Does that mean that the importance of integrated marketing across channels is more important now than ever? Or would you say that it's still primarily a handful of channels that are dominant within your marketing strategy? You, it's not that you stopped it immediately. It's, it's an evolution. It's, uh, you, you get flexible on your strategies. And if you feel like uh, uh, the, the, your target market is going to, toward that direction, you, you, you get along. Uh, so that, yeah, so you don't get like it's it's a it's a process. It's, you don't stop immediately one thing that you do. Yeah, we talk we talk a lot about existing customers and customer value and how we can keep these these guys in in the business as our as our clients. But the other thing we also need to keep in mind is that many companies try to get into new targeting groups and what do they do to get into totally new markets sometimes it seems to be easy because if you say you're online you can you can just go into new markets but it's not you have to be not only a good product you have to go to good timing localization and you have also to be a good marketing communication which is loud and more present than others. Otherwise, it's very difficult with a, with a Me Too product to move into another market. So looking into the lottery market, for example, we have so many clients that say, okay, let's mirror this and this into these countries. That's not a USP. Where is it? And if you don't have a USP and if you're, not, if you're silent, it's very difficult to approach the new markets. And so you always have to be a really good reason to decide in which countries and which markets you're going to plan to go.
So it seems like overall strategy shifted towards a more engaged, more personalized, more community-driven approach, less control, but more scale. As we wrap up in the last minute, any last comments or advice to marketers facing uh, the, uh, this change in the, in the market behavior? I think before we're like living in free second world due to all the social media, and my friend here, I think will definitely can agree with me that now we're living in one second world. Attention capturing became significantly more important lately, especially with evolution of TikTok, because people just have too much stimulation. They don't have time to watch YouTube nowadays. Actually, TikTok, people are watching more of TikTok compared to YouTube. People are going more to TikTok compared to going to Google. We're just living in such a fast-paced world that all the marketing has to adapt, even TV or something like similar. And just to add on to that, if you're saying, okay, but TikTok is you know, still primarily under 30, consider YouTube for the first time in 15 years created a new product, which is YouTube Shorts, Instagram Reels, Snapchat, I'm sure we'll see something similar on LinkedIn and TikTok, I'm sorry, Facebook now has Reels as well. So the, the, I think the key message is short vertical video is where it's at. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone on the panel. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please give it up to our amazing panelists and for this exciting conversation, for this exciting panel. We're going further. Sorry, not conversation, panel discussion, I mean. Give, it a big hand. Give them a big hand. And also, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to reach out to them and ask them questions furthermore.